Morrissey, also a Liverpool fan, you know both of them very well, who was at the game yesterday and who in 2020 narrated a documentary called Jurgen Klopp, Germany's Greatest Export. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Sue, Sue, he completely revitalised the club, didn't he? <laughs> oh gosh, yes. He brought us back from the doldrums. He's just the most extraordinary man, the most charismatic person I think I've ever met. What, what, um, what made him so charismatic, Drew? Just his humanity, I think. He was, um, his humour, his care, um, he, he just, I mean, he did slop, I hate to use that word. Um, <laughs> he, came, he, <laughs> he just became, um, I don't know, we re recognisable in the city of humour and wit. Um, he just fitted, uh, you know, he, and he does it. He does it seemingly, but if you meet him, you're immediately struck by his genuine warmth. And that, I think, is what sort of went through the club. That everyone there yesterday, you know, the staff, which I know because I go regularly, the staff were in tears, everybody, right, you know, the, the, the bar staff in the rooms, they all love him. Yeah. Um, Extraordinary, yeah. extraordinary season yeah. yesterday, wasn't it? And David, let me just ask you, what, what made him Germany's greatest export, David? Well, you know, he was, like Sue said, he was just a great fit. He came to the moment in time when we needed some new energy and he gave it to us. And, um, you know, it's true that he did that with the first team, but it was throughout the, the club. And you could feel it on the ground, you know, like Sue said, wherever you went, you know. From top to bottom, people. He would. He was. His smile was ready for everybody. He. He took the club uh, in its entirety to his heart and, and rebuilt it. And you can see, like, you know, things like the uh, League Cup final against Chelsea. I thought he'd made a mistake and was bringing the mascots on rather than players because they were so young. But they played so brilliantly <laughs> and fitted in so brilliantly because. You know, throughout the club, his ethos of how you play football was right the way through it. And um, and he played with joy and heart and passion. And he wore his heart on the sleeve and, you know, and he was connected with us as fans. And yesterday was very, very emotional for, you know, seeing him make that speech and the whole crowd. But like 10 minutes before the game finished, the crowd were on their feet to give his son just... You know, and I was... Up to top up my tan while I was on the ground. <laughs> so he did, he did take the whole city to his heart, didn't he? Because he was very, very, very active in Alderhey Hospital, for instance. He did a lot of local charity work. And he, he really, it wasn't just a football club that he took it to. You know, I mean, he, the, the work he did in Alderhey Hospital, you know, when people don't even know about it, the, right. the, the, the youngsters in there that he's gone and given his help was helped to never forget. His hopes were extraordinary, um, and I was very thrilled to uh, receive one. <laughs> <laughs> and David, he had this kind of, he had this very intense energy, didn't he? Running up and down the touchline, his glasses all over the place. Yeah, I was so uh, really lost his glasses, actually. Right? So I remember when he had his after party. Yeah. But yeah, I've never received a young adult. I have received a few jokes of the But um, yeah, see, his energy and his passion, you know, he was never going to be someone who a shrinking violence and that's what we, we sort of connected with as well. Uh, he will what was interesting, oh, sorry David, I was just going to say that what was interesting yesterday was how quietly he just sat through the whole game. And the only time, and, the, and you know, this, everyone was chanting as well, um, I'm so glad the yeah, it is around, you know, it's... Um, so We've got, we've got a lovely, almost political slogan, we've got to leave it there. So, Johnston and David Morrissey, thanks both so much. Our editor is Joshua Tindleton, Smith the studio director was Pete Wise from all of us. Goodbye. BBC News at 9 o'clock. Iran has confirmed that its president, Ebrahim Raisi, was killed in a helicopter crash yesterday. Search teams have located the wreckage of the aircraft in a remote mountainous region close to the border with Azerbaijan. The, former, the foreign minister was also killed. Karam Govadi from BBC Persian says Mr. Raisi's crackdown on protests, which followed the death of a woman in police custody in 2022, 
made him a polarizing figure. Overnight before he was announced, we saw some of the supporters of the regime who were on the streets of Tehran holding a prayer for him. However, many Iranians are celebrating his death. For example, those who lost their eyes, those who lost a limb, and those who lost a loved one during the protests over a year ago. They've been posting pictures of celebrations over his death. The final report of the public inquiry into the infected blood scandal will be published at lunchtime. More than 30,000 people were infected with HIV and hepatitis C between 1970 and 1991 after being given contaminated blood products and transfusions. The founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, may find out today whether the High Court will allow his extradition to the US. He's resisted deportation for more than a decade. Pharmacists are warning of a problem in the supply of antibiotics to treat whooping cough. There have been three times as many cases reported in England so far this year as in the previous 12 months. The Department of Health said it was working with primary care across England to support the management of the outbreak. A new report claims shareholders in some of the biggest water companies have taken out tens of billions of pounds more than they've invested. The analysis by the University of Greenwich suggests 10 firms in England and Wales have paid tens of billions of pounds in dividends to shareholders since the industry was privatised. BBC News. If you're in the mood for some coffee, cake and conversation, you can head to Cafe Hope in 45 minutes here on Radio 4, where today the chat is about a project that's keeping children off the streets of Belfast. As we've been hearing in the news, the final report into the infected blood scandal will be published today. Robin's Hour will be discussing that at 10. Now, here's Start the Week with Tom Sutcliffe. Hello. Sometimes pedigree, or provenance as it's called in the art world, is everything. When a group of American dealers bought a Renaissance painting of Christ at a New Orleans auction in 2005, they paid a little over a thousand dollars for it. It was dirty, damaged, a wreck. But the last time that painting changed hands at auction, the hammer price was four hundred million dollars. In between, it had been identified as a work by Leonardo da Vinci, Salvatore Mundi. Art, whether it's old masters or contemporary work, can command astonishing prices, and those prices can make it hard to see art for what it is. With us this morning to talk about that, about art as tradable commodity and cultural treasure, are Orlando Richard and his book All That It Is, described the rise and fall of a young art leader who got just a little too creative with his deal making. Angelina Giovanni Aga, an expert in provenance, who helps reassured, reassure buyers that there's nothing unsettling in a work of art's life history. And the curator Francesca Whitman Cooper, who's just bought Caravaggio's last painting for the National Gallery in London, a painting whose own fortunes have been transformed since an Italian bank got it for a song in the 19th century. Um, I, I take it, Francesca, that you, you would describe that painting now as priceless, which doesn't mean that it doesn't have a price, but it's not going to come up for auction. Right, so in the, in the context of the National Gallery or in the museums, uh, price is a very, it's a very strange concept. You know, if we lend a work to an exhibition, if we borrow one from an exhibition, certainly if we buy a work to acquire for the collection, you have to put a price on it. But uh, is it, to some extent, it's fairly meaningless. Do you have to put a price on it for insurance purposes? Or? Well, yes, if, if a painting's travelling, we absolutely do. But, but what does that mean? Because if something happened, you know, God forbid something were to happen to that painting, we can't replace it. I um, mean, it's irreplaceable. Caravaggios do come up for auction, don't they? I mean, a couple have come up recently, but uh, and then they disappear and they go into private sale and so on. Um, they but, do, but, so but you can, you know, you, you can't replace, you can't replace a work that's been in a public collection since, you know, the 1840s. You can't replace a work, you know, even if something comes up, it's not to say that it's going to have exactly the same calibre or quality or provenance or history. So it's a sort of, it's a slightly funny thing. We you know, sometimes talk about work, you know, once we buy a painting for the National Collection, we never deaccession it. So in a way, the price is, as soon as you bought it, it becomes almost irrelevant. It remains, though, doesn't it? It's rather paradoxical, the work, which, which uh, at the same time as saying it has no monetary value, is saying it has enormous monetary value. Uh, well, the art market obviously places a very hefty importance on pricing. After every big auction, you get 
the tagline is usually how much profit came in. So the idea of priceless in the market is very much, very tightly connected to the price of, of artworks. Um, but there is a romanticized um, value to something being priceless. And I think that's mainly related to um, cultural heritage and how people perceive art rather than how the market perceives art. Yeah, I suppose when, I mean, there literally are so the system in chat this evening. It is prices, it seems to me. It is not a commodity that can ever be sold, ever be transferred in, in, in ownership. Um, the idea of the priceless work of art, um, you know, they would be anathema to the people you write about, because it is all about the price, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, prices doesn't exist in, in the world in which I work. It's a, a, a luxury um, which, whose purview is, is, is that the museum world. Everything yeah. has its number in the particular. Your book is about uh, a friendship with a young art dealer called Inigo Fulbright, who rose very, very rapidly in the late noughties and then fell even faster <laughs> ten years later. How did you first meet him? We met at, um, at Goldsmiths University in around 2006, 2007, um, where he was already destined, um, if not for greatness, then for notoriety. Well, in, in his own mind, certainly, at the time. And he wasn't, it was just an art student, but already he was sort of looking for deals and kind of bringing you into that that orbit. Yeah, very quickly after after we met, um, he suggested putting together a few art deals, and, and I didn't really know what that would look like, but he had you know, an enormous uh, wealth of, of knowledge from the, his, his family background. His father was a, he's still a curator, and his mother is an artist, and he'd been steeped in, in the contemporary art world for yeah, the whole of his childhood. I mean, his father was a museum curator, so mm -hmm. not as it were, kind of strictly dealing in art. And, and, and no, but close to, yeah. close to those people, um, and close to the patrons who funded the museum that his father ran. So tell us about those early deals, because even when you were still at Goldsmiths as students, you were supposed to be doing kind of, with your work. We got most of that. <laughs> you got most of it done, but you were also doing these little deals. Tell us about the, the first one, selling a Paul Arrego watercolor. How did he come across it, and, and why did he think he could turn a profit? So Inigo lived in this extraordinary kind of um, genteel spot uh, next to the British Museum, in a house which is in fact still owned by the British Museum, but whose lease has been held by a curator since the late 1970s. And the house has been this kind of um, residence uh, for down and out um, curators, artists, filmmakers, designers, what have you. And Inigo found his way there aged 19, and one of the people he met there was someone who'd given Paula Arrego her first show in, uh, in London, her first commercial show in 1988. Um, and he had um, bought a, a small watercolour for himself and was looking to sell it. He took it to the now defunct, very recently defunct, Moorbrook Gallery, and they offered him a paltry sum for it. And via someone that we had met at university, we knew um, a dealer in Portugal who where she, where Paula Rego is, is a rock star, and they have, she has her own museum dedicated to her. a rock star here as well. Now, Absolutely, but, yeah. you know, there's an actual Paula Rego museum yeah. just outside Lisbon, and, um, and, and we took it on a flight, on a Ryanair flight, uh, back and forth in one morning, and sold it for 15,000 euros in cash, and then had the problem of having to fly home with this cash. Two, two things are interesting about that story, I think, when you're telling me. One is that an art dealer is, as much as being a dealer in art, as a dealer in arts. Absolutely. So that's the crucial fact, because they it's know very that they've got money and they're willing to spend it. Very difficult to be an art dealer. You're just a collector if you haven't got any insight. Yeah. The other thing is, almost immediately, you're on ethical You're smuggling the work. You're not, you're not taking the work. <coughs> Doing the money back. So right from the very beginning, the edges are clear. Absolutely, yeah. But Inigo was um, always, uh, always keen to see where the edges would take us. Um, you write this: to be a good art dealer, you need to be very prescient and manipulative. Is it possible to be a good art dealer without those two qualities? Can you just be prescient and honest? And well, I don't think that being, I don't think that being manipulative pr precludes being honest, but. Um, you know, you, you are selling things that nobody needs to people who are, are so rich they don't need to care. And so you do need to manage 
client's expectations. I mean, at a later point in the book, that's something that Inigo quite forcefully reminded me of when we were doing a deal which almost went very badly wrong together. And he said, you know, this is what you do as a marketing team. You have to manage your clients. And he was right. And you're, you're creating a narrative which kind of encourages the client to buy and, yeah. and creates the notion that they're getting a bargain and all of that stuff. Yeah, but also, I mean, the art market is... is, is respect for at almost historic lows um, and there was an enormous amount of money swirling around in the art market and there was at around sort of 2012 to 2015 um, a, a period of time where you could buy a painting from an East London gallery uh, for £30,000 and take it straight to Philips and, and they would put it into their auction and sell it for £300,000. And this is the critical point as you, you explained very early on the difference between the primary market and the secondary market. Just explain that for the listeners. So the, the primary market is any art that has been sold only once. It's sold by the, the gallerist who has worked with the artist to sell that work. Uh, the secondary market is any sale of that work after that. And so in a sense, the, the people operating in the primary market, um, you might expect to be uh, more interested in art. You know, they love art. They want to nurture artists. Um, dealers in the secondary market are essentially commodity dealers, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, um, but again, dealing with people's emotions as well as people's avarice. And, and I think that's, that's become the complicated, um, the thing that has complicated the art market. And I, I say in the book, I think that a lot of this, certainly in the public's imagination um, uh, of the art market, starts with Charles Saatchi and his, his buying of the YBAs in the early 1990s because he's buying these works for next to nothing and selling them for well, enormous sums of money. Buying the entire collection, he goes to an exhibition and buys everything. Exactly, and I think that, that that's the point at which profit becomes synonymous with the art market in the public's imagination. Now, the layman might think, when you get to the auction house, um, that the price and artwork commands there is, you know, a real-world expression of its commercial value. But what's interesting about your book is there's all sorts of things going on there, too, aren't there? All sorts of manipulations. Yeah, you can get people together in a room um, to bid up the price of an artwork if you maybe own other art other artworks by the same artist. There are, um, if you got caught, you would almost certainly not be allowed to, to bid again at that auction house. But it's very difficult to prove any kind of conspiracy, and there's no regulation in the art market which would stop that from happening. And and the and auction houses themselves also have an incentive in keeping prices high and absolutely and ways in which to do that. Of course. Um, Let's get to, he gets into trouble when you go, he starts mm. off, he has this kind of stellar career. Yeah. Um, he has his own gallery, he starts dealing. Um, he gets into trouble um, sort of later on. Can we can we talk about the Stingle paintings? Because the, the two Stingle paintings that he um, sells are where the problems really begin, or they illustrate how the problems begin. First of all, the plan B, he has this damaged Stingle painting. These are commanding high prices, aren't they? Yeah, and, and Inigo was um, was so involved in the Stingle market that at, at one point he uh, gave himself the nickname Stingle Damas. Um, you know, he, he he thought he could he could predict where he they thought he could foresee the the, the Stingle market's um, ebbs and flows with such accuracy that. Uh, um, but uh, sadly, that didn't turn out to be the case for Inigo. Um, the Plan B painting that you asked about was a painting that Inigo bought. It's a large gold painting, um, which Inigo bought from an insurance company. Um, it had been written off by the insurance company when it was damaged in a flood. Um, and Inigo thought he could get uh, a certain conservator to fix this painting, to use the conservator. And he 
is the presenter, sorry, uh, can work sometimes in the way it is um, most prominently. But this guy refused, and so Inigo was sort of stuck with this picture, which he had in, in a rather complicated fashion, which I think is a bit difficult to explain in the time frame we have here, into various art funds which he was to, which he had control of. I do think it's important, though, to, to, to tell listeners as it were, he, one of the problems was that he sold 220% of the painting because paint, the, the, you can own bits of the painting. So his, because it's in a warehouse, you never yeah. copy it, you don't want to hang it on your wall, it's just an investment opportunity. Much like um, racehorse owning, you can own a leg of a racehorse, you can own a half share, a quarter share, 10% of the painting. And yes, of course, this is the point at which we are no longer talking about collecting, we're talking about investing. And, and, and then we drift towards what essentially is a Ponzi scheme, isn't it? You take the profits from one. Yeah, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul, and but then, you know, Paul get, Paul's getting robbed too. Um, Angelina, it, it, it is no surprise that people want to know where a painting has been, given all of that. That's what you do, isn't it? That's what your company does for yes. people. Yes, yeah, so when we set out, we wanted to um, just put together an offering that would exclusively help collectors dealers of trade and museums to find out more about the ownership history of either works of art that they already own or works of art that are looking to be transacted. Luckily for us, um, we don't. there's not much need for in-depth provenance research in post-war and contemporary art, um, so we haven't thankfully had to you know, deal with people like Inigo. <laughs> It's very, <laughs> no, it's very interesting because I mean, conceptual art is particularly prone to sort of replication, isn't it? You tell the story of, um, of uh, Inigo um, having to show a, a work of art which he, he says he's bought, but he hasn't actually bought. It's by Felix Gonzalez Torres. It consists of a hundred rubber welcome mats piled in a stack. He realizes he hasn't got it. He sends off to America and just buys the rubber mats. No, there, there were absolutely moments in which the fraud scheme that Inigo perpetrated um, dipped over into the idea, the realm of conceptual art. Um, yeah. So you don't deal with that, Angelina. That's Thankfully not. Thankfully no. Thankfully no. But it is, it is really worrying because there is a pattern in the art market to sort of, you know, let such problematic people get away with a slap on the wrist because. Inigo went to prison for about four years and now he's come out and he's trying to educate the public about the best level of education in the Bureau of Prisons in England and how nobody seems to know what an art leader is, which yes. I don't think Inigo can teach them much. A lot, of, a lot of white comic criminals get into prison before they, <laughs> once, yeah, they, so once they've been. Um, are you in a rising market too? That there is more interest in provenance now, partly because of an anxiety about past ownership in the museums, I mean, for reasons of sort of colonial acquisition yeah. or imperial acquisition. Um, so the, there is more interest in There is absolutely more interest, and it's important to frame this in a positive um, viewpoint that then you don't only need to do provenance research if you think you own something problematic. Um, it's important to do provenance research at any point of your interaction with art or if you're about being part of a transaction. Or it's always better to know. Um, and we um, you would say that because you're selling the service, but does it add... Um, it adds value, absolutely. I mean, it adds value, ideally, if the result of the research is positive. Uh, there's I mean, it adds intangi intangible value as well as monetary value, because if you go with a provenance to sell it, um, it's well, much more reassuring to the buyer. There's less risk, uh, but we can never guarantee from the beginning of the process whether the end result is going to be in the favor of the buyer or not, because the most clean way to approach this is this is a service you offer to the, to the artwork. So you enhance the mystery, you, you, you bring it a bit more out of you know darkness of the past and things. People hope works of art that they've owned forever and they don't quite know what they are. They've inherited them, they've grown up with them, and then only when they're about to part with them and sell them, they find out all these incredible things about it. How do you go about your business? If I come to you and say, look, I'm interested in, in, in buying this painting, the dealer says it's a monk. It looks like a monk to me, but I don't know much about it. Um, how do you go about the business next? Well, I always have another question for those of you. As to about me. Yes, about how you acquired the work, oh, why it's right. in your possession, um, and then you started what is a rather complicated process of um, a multi 
social research. So we look at the ownership history, we very often collaborate with labs, so that they can do the pigment testing and the different types of um, rubber pigment testing. And then we speak to a lot of you know, experts who engage with the emotion medium in a way. Um, so, so there's connoisseurship. But there's then there's also kind of documentary, simple documentary. Yes, so research. there is provenance research, which is strictly the ownership history research and everything you can dig out. Um, there is a technical analysis where you need the science to back up the claim of whatever attribution you're trying to give to a work of art. And then ultimately there is the opinion of the connoisseur, who is ideally placed to be the person who knows the most about the particular artist. Um, so where, while the decision rests with the connoisseur, all of these components need to align uh, to tell the right story of an art work. Because the secrecy, I mean, it's a theme in your book as well, Miranda. A lot of directors are very secretive. They don't want people to know what they do, because it is an investment. Um, even though they don't make, they don't make a large profit on it. So the secrecy must make it harder for you sometimes, doesn't it? It does. I mean, we have a lot of, especially art markets, uh, people who want us to sign NDAs uh, before we look at the artwork they have. Um, but then we have to tell them that, well, we are capable of carrying out this research just privately. Uh, just, I could just do it myself, but then you have to tell the client that you need to travel to Paris and New York and Brussels and very quickly it becomes more of a too much of an expensive exercise, so they're happy for you to disclose parts of it to people who bring the cost down. <laughs> so. There's no reason for an NDA really uh, when you're doing research and when you are very clear that the only reason you have this information is to carry out your due diligence and not shop it around for people to sell or... I mean, that's the point, isn't it? That, that with provenance and with provenance research, there is obviously an ethical quicksand you can just see off in the corner there. I mean, people have gone into it famously. Bernard Berenson, famous art expert, Renaissance art expert, gave advice to Joseph Duveen, whose name is still in the tape there, in the Duveen galleries, and kind of sort of upped, upped the pedigree of various works in order to sell them to American clients. Yes, I think we try to separate connoisseurship from art dealing as much as possible. Uh, there are gaps in the market because there is unfortunately declining interest in old masters. Uh, so we find ourselves even frequently now with gaps where we're looking to identify certain connoisseurs or leading art historians or artists that might not be as famous as Caravaggio or uh, you know the the usual suspect. So it becomes increasingly harder to find um, art to find scholars to assist with the project if we fully exclude old master dealers. Yeah, that, that that's the dream, obviously, though, uh, that um, kind of fuels the popular view of this, like Faith or Fortune, or yes. Britain's Lost Masterpieces, is that you're going to find some work of art that's been lost. Um, but do you sometimes find, in doing provenance, that you add value simply because of the collection that it has been painted? Absolutely. You know, if, it, if Kenneth Clark owned it, yes. does the price go up? I think... It would be very difficult to say for a fact that if you name all the previous owners that the price will go up by a certain percentage because it ultimately depends on who's in the room and what's being cooked in the room and what else is on the sale. Um, but it, it helps reassure the buyer that they are buying a, a solid, that it's a solid investment. And knowing who it's been through and whose collection it's been in, uh, it adds to a fascinating story. So it's always better to know. When you're going through the archives, do you sometimes find pictures that have gone missing entirely? Um, oh, absolutely. You know yeah. Absolutely. I actually, uh, I've been working on this very little known case of looted modern British paintings. Uh, it started during my uh, master's thesis and it sort of stayed with me since because obviously I wasn't able to solve it in what, about six months. And it's been a decade and I still haven't been able to fully solve it. But Basically, in 1940, there was a traveling exhibition that was organized by Wilderness Gallery in London to tour the French provinces. And it listed everyone who's famous as a modern British art book Vanessa Bell, Duncan Grant, Stanley Spencer, Augustus John. Very big names. Very big names. And they worked with loans of this traveling exhibition. They went to France, and then obviously, very soon, France capitulated. So the paintings never came back to London. and. They seem to have been discovered in the first look of the tour, which was in the Musée uh, de Beaux-Arts tour. 
um, in, two years later, brought to Paris, and then for some very strange reason, they end up with the German Navy. Um, and well, you need paintings, I suppose, in the boardroom, in the mess room. Yes, absolutely, and that's a very likely explanation as to what likely happened to them. So I was very curious to see what happened to them after the war, um, and they seem to have a few of them sort of popped up in the market, but no one seems to know that there is this tiny little bit of their history that is actually really dark. But we don't associate art looting during World War II with modern British art. No, no, um, no. So to me, it, yeah, um, it's yeah, it's stuck with me, and it's very difficult to shake off because I'd like to I'd like to find out. There's some missing dots. There's some missing dots, you want yes. To I'm connect. happy to tell the story in writing, hopefully. So I now, you say some of those paintings have re-emerged in the market, yes. but not all of them. So some of not them are still out. There was about 24 paintings in the exhibition. About two or three have turned up recently. So there's so a lot of... <laughs> it was a lot to find out. Um, so obviously, if, if one of those paintings emerged, you would want to have a, a, a decent provenance uh, in order, if you wanted to sell it, um, rather than keep it, you would want a decent provenance in order to be able to do that, which must lead to the temptation to make the provenance up. Uh, is that a problem for you, fake provenances as well as fake paintings? I, I would say it is not in the context of the British paintings that I've been researching. Not those ones. Not no. those ones, only because there is no cause for concern for that genre and group of paintings in general. Uh, but yes, I mean, it has been known historically to happen, especially in the 90s with the aftermath of World War II and the raising concerns of um, Jewish collections being looted during World War II. There have been known instances where Jewish names in the post-war period have either been completely erased or they have been edited to sound less Jewish or provenance gaps have been filled with names that just are purely never owned the work. So yes, there's a lot of that. And the Beltrakis, tell me about them, because they, they were fakers. They faked the paintings, yes. but they then also faked the problem. Yes, it's what my nightmares are made of, fake provenance <laughs> trails. <laughs> how did they, just explain how they went about it? Well, his wife was uh, partnering with him. Obviously, she collaborated in helping fake provenance evidence. So Beltraki would, let's say, paint um, a work of art in the style of an artist and then his wife would dress up in period clothing pretend she was her grandmother and the painting would be hanging behind her in, in the kitchen <laughs> so, so, that, so that they had documentary so photographs they had documentary which evidence. they must have presumably aged as well yes yes they I mean he was incredibly smart and to this day he has refused to disclose every single collector gallery auction that he has defrauded and he's accepted to go to prison only for the crimes that he's actually been uh, found guilty of which shows an, a very arrogant level of confidence that you are not going to get caught and if those artworks end up in major museums you can understand you know his how would he he's obviously gone to a great deal of trouble how was he eventually caught uh, he was caught because he used a um, pigment that wasn't previously available, I believe it was titanium white, in a painting that was supposed to date before titanium white was introduced. A rookie error as far as a forger is concerned. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I think it was more a mistake. It was probably he had the tube laying around and he... He I don't got, care he got I don't, careless. Yes, I think he got careless. I don't think he didn't know per se. Um. Francesco uh, Whitman Cooper, Angelina says that's a nightmare for her, but it's a nightmare for any curator, isn't it? That notion that the work of art may not be what you you think it is. Oh my goodness, <laughs> utterly terrifying, <laughs> utterly terrifying. So yes. tell us a little bit, you have just bought the martyrdom of Saint Ursula, um, which is said to be the last Caravaggio. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly very, very late, um, wherever you place it. Um, Tell us a little of the life story of that, because it wasn't, as it were, that physical object was not always regarded as the last Caravaggio. No, so we now call this painting the last Caravaggio. Effectively, for probably about a hundred years, it was it was a lost Caravaggio. So this is a painting which we know now that Caravaggio is working on in <coughs> May 1610 in Naples. So this is literally two months before he dies. We know that because in 1980, a letter is discovered in the state archives in Naples, 
which talks about that commission being finished. So there's a business agent in Naples writing to his boss in Genoa saying, I've got your painting, the St. Ursula by Caravaggio. Everyone who's seen it's amazing. Unfortunately for this business agent, he's kind of gone down in art history as the man who took a Caravaggio out in the sun to dry, which we wouldn't recommend for anyone working on painting. He, 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 he writes, he's rather anxious, isn't he? Yes. That he may have kind of damaged that Something's it. funny has happened to the varnish and he's got to get Caravaggio back round to work out, you know, what it is and how, how to make sure he doesn't damage the painting. But effectively, what that gives us is a very, very precise date. It's, it's quite unusual in Baroque painting that you know exactly on the 11th of May, 1610, Caravaggio's finished a painting and he's given it to, to the agent in Naples. Now you say that letter came out in 1980. Yes. Before that, um, was this a picture that people thought was out there and they didn't know where it had gone? No, not really. So as, as the painting's finished at the end of May, 1610, it goes up to its patron in Genoa and it remains there in the Doria collections, the Doria family collections, for um, a couple of hundred years. Initially, we know now that it's archived as St. Ursula by Caravaggio, blah, blah, blah. But over time, it loses that attribution. So it gets separated both from Caravaggio's name and from the subject matter. So uh, that's just a matter of paperwork, is it? That somehow it kind of gets separated from the, the catalogue that says that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think it is. It's sort of, I don't want to call it a filing error, but it's just, you know, these families have these big inventories and over time, different artists assume different, different degrees of importance. So actually in the 19th century, Caravaggio, superstar today, it's, it's not really that highly regarded, so it's not the kind of picture people are worrying about. It's not, at that moment, the most expensive painting in the collection, so it sort of tumbles into the, the sideline. That's a critical well. thing, isn't it, when we think about lost paintings, is we, yeah. we, we forget that they, they rise and fall in terms of their kind of assumed value. I mean, artistic value, Absol no, absolutely. not just commercial and value. Yeah, and that taste changes, and that, you know, Caravaggio now, I think it's impossible for us to...